So again, that's basically what the proteins do that are embedded in the um, cell membrane, and also um, at least the and what they do. God bless you. And what they do. Questions so far? There's more again about the anatomy. Now we're going to talk more about how things can get into the cell and how things can go out of the cell. What does it mean by semi-permeable? How does that actually do it? Because you don't want everything to come in and you don't want everything to go out. You want to have some kind of control. Okay? So we have movement through this plasma membrane. And I kind of break it up two ways. We can either have means of no mediate, mediated assistance. It's just it'll allow you to go through, it's just a natural kind of thing, a normal gradient, okay? And we have simple diffusion, osmosis, and filtration. But then we have other things that need some kind of mediated assistance, some kind of power to do, open up these doors to allow things to come in. So we're going to talk about these two different ones. So think of it as two groups here. All right, and this is an overview of we'll discuss all of them as we go along. So let's first talk about the non-mediating transport mechanisms, things like simple diffusion, osmosis, and filtration. Simple diffusion, you've heard of this before. It's moving things from a higher concentration to a lower crunch concentration. That's natural. If I have 150 people outside this room, and I have two people inside this room, which way are the people want to go, naturally? Do they want to come in or do they want to go out? They want to come in, right? It goes from a high concentration to a low. So I'm going to wake you up a little bit. Let's say, and you've got to look this way too. Let's say here, I flatch it. Now you're all thinking, like, well, where is this going? I flash it, you know, that kind of thing. It comes out of my back end, right? Now, she isn't going to be too happy. Why? Because the smell is going to be very concentrated over here. All right, you're not going to be happy. No. All right? But what's going to happen here, and what's your name in the back? I'm sorry. Ashley. Ashley. She's okay. She's all the way in the back over there. I don't smell anything. It's not going to come here. You know, just wait. See, what will happen is it's going to get really concentrated here, and it's going to go from a high concentration to a low concentration until it's equal, and that everybody can smell the wonderful aroma that's coming out of my body. Right? It's going to be all there equally. And it won't be so strong over here, but you'll still smell it. Right? That's diffusion, going from a high concentration to a low. Boy, I'm putting in people's mental pictures now. Not a good thing, right? So that's what that is, and that deals also with charges. If we have more sodium on the outside and less sodium on the inside, it's going to go that way. And sodium could be a substance, but there's also a charge. If more positive on the outside, it wants to come in. So think of it that way too, not just flatulence or gas, but think of organic molecules. Think of charges also. Okay? So it also depends on the permeability. Meaning, that if I put a brick wall in between, what's your name? Amalia. Amalia. So if I put a brick wall between Amalia and Ashlyn, Ashlyn, right? She isn't going to smell it. Because it's, the smell is not through that brick wall. But certain things are. If I put a screen there instead of a brick wall, it'll go through it. So you have to think in those terms, as long as it's permeable for that. Okay? So we have water-soluble and larger ligands. Now we're going back to the membrane. Water-soluble means that there's a charge on it. Okay, it's polar. Now that is impermeable because inside the middle part of the membrane is hydrophobic. It doesn't like polar molecules. It doesn't like sodium. That's polar, right? As a charger. So it's going to repel. So if you have this phospholipid bilayer,
And this is the intracellular fluid, and this is the extracellular fluid. Right? If we have some kind of, let's say, sodium molecule, that cannot get through this membrane. It's going to ricochet right off. Okay? Because there's a part in there that doesn't like charges. Is that clear? All right? Also, if we have a relatively large molecule, even if it's hydrophobic and it's huge, that too is not going to be able to get through this. just So they're going to have to find another way to get inside the cell. We won't talk about that for a moment, but we can have a membrane, I'm sorry, a protein that's in there. that may have a channel. Now this can go through here. I'm from Jersey, and New York City is right over the Hudson River. Certain things can get right through that water. Boats, submarines. That's the hydrophobic stuff. They can get right through there. Certain things can't. Motorcycles and cars. They have to go through a tunnel. We can turn a bomb to pick one. Alright? So, so things can get through there, but it depends. On if it's water soluble, they can't get through the membrane. They have to go through a channel. And sometimes the channel will be gated. If it's hydrophobic, or a small molecule, so hydrophobic or a water insoluble, they can pass right through these things. No problem. And they can go the other way too. No problem. Is that clear about that? Because inside doesn't like water, so if that doesn't like water, that substance doesn't like water either, it'll go right through there. And those are more like our lipids and steroids, right, are fats. Whereas over here, this is going to be more like your proteins and ions. They can't get through them. They have to go through some sort of channel. Is that clear? So if you have a lot of sodium out here, very little over here, as long as you've got a channel that allows it to go through, it's going to go from a high concentration to a low. Is that clear? Okay? And this is just showing you a little face, but I just I didn't have to draw it. I don't know there is on here. Alright? It can either just pass through here, or it might have to go through a tunnel or channel. Same thing as the pill, right? You got the pill that goes in, in the water over here, it's going to dissolve. That's very concentrated there. When that goes in, gradually it gets dissolved until the whole area over here, when you take this section of the solution or this section of the solution, it's still going to have an equal amount of solutes to water. Right? We see this also in gas exchanges. When you breathe in oxygen, 
you bring it, breathe it in, you're bringing a whole bolus of oxygen to your lungs. Well, the veins that carry blood to your lungs are very low in oxygen. So it's simple diffusion. It's going to go from a high concentration of oxygen in the lungs to a lower concentration that's in the veins. And that's how it gets on board. Likewise, carbon dioxide does the same thing. It's going to be very high in carbon dioxide in the veins, low compared to what you breathe in. There is carbon dioxide in the air, but compared to what's in the veins, so it's going to go from carbon dioxide from your veins going into the lungs and you blow that out. Simple diffusion. That's it. Now, let's talk about osmosis. Okay? Osmosis is diffusion. It's the fusion of a certain type of molecule. And that's it. And you know what it is by the word, right? Water molecules. So we're just specifically talking about, in osmosis, the fusion of a high concentration of water molecules to a low concentration of water molecules. That's it. It's the fusion, but for water molecules. Now. We do have in our cell wall something called aquaporins. You see, water is a very interesting thing. Water can pass through here. Not so good, but it has some properties that would be able to pass through there. But we also have these aquaporins, where most of the water molecules have to pass through these little spe specific channels, these water channels. And osmosis, like I said, there's two ways. It either goes just, the water molecules go, just go right through the fossil filer. Not a lot of it, but it does. It's got a weird property, as you've seen with water having weird properties. But mostly, it goes to the aquaporins more quickly, and it's more efficient to go through there. So here's an aquaporin. These water molecules, most of them go through here, but there's going to be some that's going to be able to get through this membrane. Okay? You'll hear about aquaporins later on. And they're always open. These gates are always open. More water out there than there's in here, and vice versa, right? Or which other? All right, so we talked about this before. Definition, right? Solute, solvent, solution. So quick review, make lemonade, right? You got water, you got lemonade crystals. You take the lemonade crystals, you put it in the water, you got yourself a solution. All right? The water is the solvent, the crystals is the solute. You make the solution. Simple as that. All right? Now, we've got to talk about hypotonic solutions and hypertonic solutions. And you'll be learning about this in the lab tomorrow. So a hypo solution is that there's more molecules of water outside the cell. Okay? A hypotonic solution. And what this is going to do is that it's going to draw in water from the outside to the inside. And I'll show you a picture so you understand what this is. We also have a hypertonic solution where the cell is put into a solution that has a lot more solutes than there is for water. And in this case, the cell, cell's water wants to escape from the cell to try and dilute the solution itself. And then we have isotonic solutions. Oh, that iso, isotopes, isomers, isotonic, right? But iso, I mean, that's where you got to put things together. This is a pretty obvious one, but when you take more and more classes in science, you start putting things together. Jesus, isotopes, isomers, and isotonic. Iso, iso, iso must mean something. What do those three things have in common? The word same, right? So that's what this is. Iso means same. So what an isotonic solution is, is that there's the same concentration inside that it is outside of the cell. And in this case, there's no fluid that's going to go on either way. Okay? So 
in a cell with its environment, we have two solutions, inside the cell and outside the cell. Okay? And it's separated by a semi-permeable membrane, allowing certain things to come in and out. My little mnemonic here is that water follows solute. Water will go where there's a higher concentration of solute. Understand it though. So what I have over here, put your pencils down. I want to make sure everyone's on the same situation here, or the same page. Just put your pencils fine. Everything's up here. And I'll be, it's being recorded too. But I want everyone to be on the same page here so you understand what's going on. And it's also about the lab too. Forget about what's going on over here. Let's look at this situation here. Okay? Here you have a cell that you put in a solution that is what we call hypotonic. Now, the little dots over here will represent, let's say, sodium ions. And the space in between the sodium ions is water. So if you look inside the cell, it's very concentrated, right? The, the dots are very close to each other. But the ones outside here, they're spaced out. So that cell is in a hypotonic solution. It's in a solution where there's more water outside the cell than it is inside the cell. Are we clear with that? All right? A little baby stuff to get there. All right. Now, you put this cell in there, but it wants to become go to an equilibrium. It wants to make that the, that the, the spacing in between the, the dots here are equal on both sides. But here's the little clincher. Those dots are not allowed to leave or enter that cell. The only thing that can is water, the space. So how would you make this so that the spacing between the dots are equal? Water into here or take water out? Go in, right? Because there's more water on the outside than there is on the inside. And when it does, the cell's going to expand. Does that make sense? Sometimes it might expand so much that it bursts. We call that lysis. L Y S I S. You'll see it in the next few slides. It expands. Clear with that, right? Now let's look at this situation here. You put a cell in what we call a hypertonic solution. You're putting a cell into something where the dots are very, very close with each other. It's a high concentration compared to what's on the inside. But again, those dots, those sodium ions, are not allowed to enter or leave the cell. But the water is. The white space around it is. So how would you want to, which way do we expect the water to go? Inside the cell or outside the cell to make the spacing equal on both sides? Outside. outside. So then what happens to the cell itself? It shrivels up. We call that crenation. It crenates. Okay. Now, certain bacteria. This is. Let me just explain something too. Certain bacteria have a verb, have a cell wall to it, and that cell wall, as I explained to the plant, they don't lose a lot of water. They won't burst. Our cells will. Red blood cells will do that. They will burst. But plant cells, they tend not to. Certain bacteria tend not to. But if you put salt on certain bacteria, they'll shrivel up. And this is the basis of how, why you want to salt meats. You've heard of that, right? You put salt on the meats to make sure the bacteria doesn't go on there. Because that is making the meat more of a salty solution. And if bacteria go on there, it's going to shrivel up and all the mechanisms that go inside the bacteria are not going to function properly and they'll die. They tend to work okay over here because they just get bigger. But we learned that with salt meats, that that's what will happen. Now another way that you could actually see this is going to the beach. 
You go to the beach, which is, and go in the water, the salt water. When you go in there, you're putting your body into a very salty environment. You're putting your body in a hypertonic solution. And what's the first thing you see within 10 minutes? What happens to your fingers? Yeah, you got the little wrinkles pretty fast. Because water escaped from your body, to tr it'll never work this way, but it's trying to dilute the salt water. It's not going to happen. I, we know that. But what's also something you notice that if you're sitting, if you're actually in the salt water for a long time, what's going to happen? Not even a long time. You're in there for like 15, 20 minutes. What happens? Yeah, it will taste salty, but don't you want to run into shore and get some fruit punch? Right? You see, your, your thirst mechanism kicks in because all this water is leaving your body. You eat a lot of salty pretzels, again, you want to drink with that, right? Salt does that. But you have mechanisms in your body to try and get more fluids into your body, thirst mechanisms, and a bunch of other hormones and things that which I want to get into. All right? So does that make sense with this? And then the last one is pretty easy. If you put a cell into an environment that is equal amount, then the cell is not going to change size at all. It's not going to create. It's not going to lice or get bigger or blow up or get bigger. So this is the ideal thing. And so it's being put into an isotonic solution. All right, does that make sense? Now let me go ahead. If you put yourself in some kind of salty solution, yeah. If you put yourself in a hypertonic solution, I'm just using salt water because I think everybody can relate to it. But if you want to put yourself in calcium chloride solution, go right ahead. It's the same thing. You might burn yourself a little bit with the potassium on there, but it'll work the same way. Yeah. Because your body is trying to dilute that, which will never happen. Now let me also talk about this too, because I think this is important. I, I got everyone here, and I want you to see how you're applying this stuff. If your red blood cell, okay, that's the thing that's going to carry oxygen. If your red blood cell inside is 0.9% sodium chloride, you have this big cell, right? Red blood cell. And inside is going to be 0.9% sodium chloride. Not quite 1%, but it's there. And we have intracellular fluid and extracellular fluid. And the extracellular fluid is called plasma. And that's the liquid portion that's in your blood. But you have these cells that are just floating around there too. Now I got a question. If you've ever been to the hospital, or you know someone who's in the hospital, you see bags of fluid that's going to someone's arm. They're putting in 0.9% sodium chloride into the bloodstream. Why? Right. What's going to happen is, if you're going to put fluid out here that's going to be 9% sodium chloride, does fluid want to go into the cell or fluid want to go out of the cell? Neither. You, you're putting an isotonic solution in that person's blood. See? What if I put distilled water and you're thinking, well, distilled water is good to put into your bloodstream. It's distilled. There's no salts in there. Ah, but what's going to happen? You're putting the outside is going to be more hypotonic or is it going to be more hypertonic? Hypo. There is more water molecules out there than there is in here. Does that make sense? If that happens, What's going to happen to our red blood cell? What's going to happen? 
It's going to expand. It's going to do this first thing here. And in fact, it would probably will burst. It'll just pop. Not a good thing. This is why we don't put distilled water in people's blood. Does that make sense? I'm trying to give you this into real life situations. I saw all your surveys, and right now, it looks like there's about a third of the class that want to be an MD. This is the kind of stuff you got to put together. Just, just knowing what this is and memorizing it is not going to get you anywhere. You've got to know how to apply this stuff. You want to be an MD? You want to work? Like most of these are going to, it seems like most of these are going to go into the health field or engineering. You're helping people. You better make sure you know darn right you know what you're doing and why. All right? It makes sense, though. And vice versa, if I'm going to give, let's say, um, in this case, I'll give, let's say, 20% sodium chloride. What do you think is going to happen? What's going to happen to red blood cells? 20% compared to 0.9%. Is it in a hypertonic solution or a hypotonic solution? Hyper. Think of you in the ocean. What's going to happen to this red blood cell? Dribble. Not good either. So that's why we put 0.9% sodium chloride. In fact, if you have contact lenses, saline is 0.9% for that same reason. You don't want your eye to swell or, or shrivel, right? Works the same way. All right. Questions about that? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Not more more water molecules. It'll look like this. This is hypotonic. You're putting more water in here, which means that the this. Any sodium chloride that's out in outside the cell is going to get further apart because you're putting more water in there. All right, here. Let's go back to our lemonade. Okay? We got crystals and we got water. Okay? If I put more water in there, not crystals, more water in there, is it going to be bland or is it going to be really concentrated? If I put more water, not crystals, not those, you know, lemonade crystals. You're just putting more water in there. So is that, is your lemonade going to be diluted? Or is it going to be concentrated? When you taste it, you're going to be like, or is it going to be like, bland, I got more flavor. Bland, right. So what you're doing is you're putting more water, which means that the solution is going to be more hypotonic. There's more water molecules in your solution. Is that clear? Okay. Does everyone make sense? Hint, hint. There's going to be a question or two on the exam. I mean, I, even have, I might even have questions in the lab also. Because it's the same concept, right? Questions on it? I want you to be able to apply this material. Okay. We clear with that then? All right. And this is just showing the same thing, except a permeable membrane. It's the same thing as osmosis. So now, this is everything I talked about, just a quick review, all right? What do cells do? In hypo, hypotonic solutions, they will have lysis. They'll expand, and if it gets too big, they will lyse, they will burst, like a balloon, okay? Crenation occurs in hypertonic solutions, where they're going to shrivel, become less than weight, okay? So think of how your fingers appear in the high salt ocean. Okay? Questions on that? All right? That'll save us some time for tomorrow. Because next tomorrow's lab is going to be so big. Yeah. All right? But I mean, it's, you know, I mean, it's, okay. All right. So osmoregulation. Ooh. Okay? Hypertonic or hypotonic environments create this osmotic problems for organisms. And they have to adjust to it. So you've got to control this water balance. 
Now, a paramecium is a good example of how it evolved to handle this stuff. A paramecium is this protist. We're going to see them in the micro probably not in the microscopes. If you want, to okay, sure. okay, we may be able to see this. All right, a protist. This is a protist that is hypertonic to its surrounding pond water. Okay, you can already picture what's going on over here. So it's put into a an environment that's hypotonic. Does that make sense? Give you a moment to let that register. You put a cell into a hypotonic solution. It's more concentrated inside, it's less concentrated outside. So if you let it be, will that paramecium shrivel or will it expand? Expand and burst. Right? Does that make sense? So the paramecium has a problem here. It needs to be able to if water's coming in, it needs to get rid of that water before it bursts. Well, it adapted, it evolved. It has something called a contractile vacuum. As the water comes in, it's, this vacuum is a pump, takes in the water and then pumps it right out. All right, so there is our paramecium. This filling of the vacuole gets filled up, and it comes to a point, I don't know how it actually works, but it comes to a point where it's going to shoot it all out, and it, the vacuole becomes small. All right? So different animals have found different ways of doing things. And you could imagine why you can't put a certain freshwater fish, like a trout, and put it in the ocean. It hasn't adapted to seawater, right? And vice versa. Cell walls of plants, we have a hypotonic environment. Plant cell swells until the wall opposes uptake. All right? So this is good. I mean, it's not going to burst, but that's what the cell wall is going to do. It's going to create this turgid, this firmness, so that it actually goes up. If you have less water, the, the flower or the stem wilts, right? So you need some kind of turgor in there, turgid, uh, to give firmness. In an isotonic uh, environment, the plant becomes flaccid, all right, and it starts really wilting. It's got to have some sort of uh, situation where there's going to be a hypotonic solution, otherwise it will start doing that, okay? And in a hypertonic solution, don't give the friggin' plant salt water, okay? It's just not going to work. All right, the plant cell loses water because it's trying to put your finger or put your body in the ocean water. It's going to make the water leave your body, or in this case, leave the plant cell to try and dilute that area there. That will mean that the, the cell is going to die. Okay? Does that make sense? Yeah? All right, so this is just animal versus plant, and you can do this and see what's going on. We turn, um, you know, hypotonic uh, and hypertonic solution. And it's just a summary of that all. Sound good? All right, so we talked about, these are the, the um, this is the transport mechanisms again, that do not need mediated assistance. It just naturally will do this. We talked about simple diffusion. We talked about a subtype of that, which is osmosis. And the last one is filtration. And it's pretty easy when uh, students make their coffee. Okay, It's just a pressure that's going to go on. And it naturally, there's a high pressure to a low pressure, it naturally wants to go that way. So it works like a strainer. All right? And you get into the kidneys, that's basically how that works. Right? You put more push in there, more force, more pressure. It's going to go from a high pressure area to a low pressure. Okay?